Hello world of YouTube and welcome to something I haven't done in a long time on this particular segment on the channel. Uh, a reformatted discography review, taking one of the many old discography reviews I did from the first era, first couple of eras of the channel's life. I'm doing them in the worst to best format that I do the show in now. Now there were a couple of reasons why this particular portion of the discography review is kind of ground to a halt. Uh, first and foremost, I dissolved the Patreon, which is where these were happening at a regular pace and it was kind of an incentive for patrons. Uh, and that kind of fell apart or led to the Patreon's dissolvement when some of those bands that I had done far off in advance had started releasing albums. Uh, while I had those private episodes out in the ether, that kind of already started to bleed into what was releasing in the vein of like the Bullet for My Valentine review. So I was kind of pumping the brakes on doing the reformatted discography reviews while all the bands I had left were releasing stuff. And then as that calmed down and the waves sort of settled, I would start to round things out. I'm going to start doing that now, here soon. And I figured I'd start with a band that, while teasing something that they never ended up releasing, hasn't made a peep about said thing for a couple of years. And given the sort of low profile of the band... I'm going to assume that it's going to not happen for a while. If it happens now, I can have this and then make a new video in the new format, a la what I did with Everything Everything. The band in question, Chicago Indie Darlings to Me, Driftless Pony Club. I got into them via their singer Craig's YouTube channel, uh, Wheezy Waiter, which I, I, I had Wheezy Waiter merch. I don't know where it went. It's somewhere. It would have been where Roy is. I've been a fan of... Weezy Waiter for a while, he's inspired my channel in a couple of ways, but I consider his, like, early material in particular to be kind of like comfort YouTube. I don't watch it, like, I don't rewatch it often, but I have before. But his band kind of existed in a parallel realm to his YouTube channel, and the band in question are an incredibly talented batch of musicians that have a really consistent small discography. Some of the releases they've done I'd consider some of my favorites of the genre, you know, for a band that is very much inspired by groups like Built to Spill and Modest Mouse and Pixies slash Weezer to some degree. Uh, they found ways to turn that influence into their own brand of indie rock that I think is very well pulled together. You know, I think Craig and Matt are really good guitarists, and I think that their songwriting style in particular is uh, interesting. I, I like that overall how the band kind of creates uh, some concepts in some of their records and how they explore them and bring them to a level of relatability that transcends sort of the, the songwriter-ass songwriter moments that they achieve. Uh, I love Sam's bass work as well. I think he's a pretty damn good bassist, and he works really well with uh, Nate, their drummer's sort of intricate and moments way of playing. I love their uh, their rhythm section in general. I think that they have a core unity that shines. And overall, I just don't think you can't really go wrong with any of their five albums that they do have that, like I said, I'll be ranking from worst to best. But before I get into that ranking, we, they do have one EP that I am gassed as fuck to talk about. Give it a like if you're excited. And let's talk about Expert. I can feel If I were putting Expert in the worst to best ranking, it would be my favorite thing of theirs. It was my jumping on point, and I didn't know that it would be my favorite thing running away from their discography at the end or other end of that, but I, I wouldn't say that diving into their discography is a waste, even if I found my favorite thing first. I do think that if we're talking like textbook song for song great ratio, out of a catchy, well-written indie rock project, Expert is that. It's a tight 20-minute listen. It's a great commute record. It has some moments that sort of push their sounds to bigger horizons in ways that they were kind of trying to amp up on Cholera, but it acts as a good pivot point in their sound in a nice little sort of proof-of-concept package. Tracks like Legends of Archery, Imaginary Blood, and Maps of Low Fidelity have this just openness to their sound. The guitars pack a nice punch, and the drums are nice and thunderous 
while some of the texturing that's added on tracks like Imaginary Blood and Pluto and Neptune via the keyboard sounds create a sort of evolution on where they had played with parts of their sound on their first two releases. Uh, the lean bass groove on Thanks Earthquake is a nice lower key moment that still has some incredible catchiness in its chorus. And I like that Bike as a middle of the project, more leaner, energetic, bitier rock song. It's got some nice swagger to its songwriting that I think is great. I also like some of the expressions shown in some of the songwriting. I love the pair of loves of competitiveness via Planets on Pluto versus Neptune. I like how well I feel like they capture the feeling of Phantom Limb via Imaginary Blood. The love to a global scale on Thanks Earthquake is expressed if incredibly. I just, I love this project. I think that if you want like a good proof of concept for this band as a whole when it comes to great songwriting, a tight unit as a band with some showcasings of components that do get fleshed up more on their full-fledged records. Expert, in my opinion, is one of the best places to start. Uh, not just because it was mine, but because I think that it is a good, not only bridge of their eras, of their sides of the discography, but transitions and widens their sound masterfully. I just fucking love this EP. Now let's take a look at their discography album by album, starting with... Magnificent's biggest accomplishment is how well it links its ideas of pairs in a city sort of throughout various stages of the decay of civilization. I love the through line that kind of connects the relationship driven tracks like Circuit Dust, Men of Action, and Your Manhattan, which have this overall observance of mistakes, trying to overcome them via maybe not the best of ways, and coming to agreeance with each other's mistakes on the other end of it. You know, there's even a twinge of frustration coming out on All Quiet with its sort of snarky songwriting. Uh, and delivery from Craig, it almost feels like kind of a, an argument amongst two, but uh, just the one side of it. And that parallel of your Manhattan being a uh, sort of direct comparison to the other huge thematics across the, the album of the world at large and the cities around you. You know, the dissolvement of a city via City You Know, which talks about sort of the a city that was once thriving being lost to time. Uh, they built the future being the sort of prospects of those wishing to expand those cities past the relics that were that are decaying around them. Which again, similarly to your Manhattan, sort of sees itself in a more optimistic twist by the time Fountain City uh, comes around the bend to close the album out. It's an album with an interesting parallel, and I enjoy that. And I like the songs a lot, but when compared to the rest of their catalog, I feel like the the this is their most solid album. It's not necessarily full of any bad songs. There's just a handful of ideas that are just done better throughout pockets of their discography. I talked about the snarkiness of All Quiet, and I love that. It almost feels like them tapping into their Janelle days. I also love the hook of City You Know. It almost feels like an awkward conversation between a friend showing their other friend their dying city. Tracks like Circuit Us and They Built the Future and Men of Action feel like sort of expansions and, and, exper and extensions from Buckminster's sort of place that it put their sound, especially with some of the synthetic backdrops and chorus writing. Um, and I love those tracks, and I think that they are pretty solid avenues to take that sound. I also enjoy the more subdued moments like Bedrolls Across America and Your Manhattan. I think that they are weird next to each other in the, in the record, but I do think that they are good songs uh, for their own reasons. I like the the sort of glimmers at optimism, or at least the the acceptance of not immediate change in bedrolls across America, and I think that the softer ideas, or the softer sonic approach, sort of gives this comfort to that acceptance that I think comes across really well. There's just a lot of cool ideas on this project. I just think that if I'm gonna put any record of theirs on the bottom, it's gonna be this. I think that it's a, still a place you should get to, and I think that it has, again, a nice use of its songwriting ideas. I just think that they've done better. Wait, 
Oddly enough, Zestera, their most recent album as of recording this video, actually kind of feels like a response to Magnificent uh, a handful of years down the line because it has this observance of oneself in a meta sense while juxtaposing that with more impending doom feelings of the world at large and marries the two very well in a way that feels very cut from the same cloth as Magnificent, but also throws these fun sort of call and response moments or sort of planning and payoff lyrical bits that I think unify the record better than Magnificent. You know, it still talks about various stages of life, but it takes it to the stretches of time, all the while sort of having this uneasement to the future that gets sort of resolved and brought back around uh, by the time I Need a Mirror and Nikola Tesla uh, come into the track listing. It's very insular in narration by having these I-titled songs, but all of those songs sort of tie into the thematics of trying to prevent the end of time. It all feels very grand in scale in, from a songwriting sense, and I think that sonically the band uh, matches some of that scale pretty amicably, while also finding avenues to explore Magnificent's ideas into some awesome concepts, like the opener chorus complains with its loop synth percussion below their live drums. I think that it's a really cool moment to open the record in on that also introduces some of those uh, meta ideas and talking about how the audience wants a big spectacle, uh, but not necessarily the consequences of it. While also introducing that dying world in all of its grand splendor. It even goes through this sort of immediate non-acceptance of that doom in the following track, but doubling down on the direness of the situation at hand of the world really coming to an end by, and also being a much leaner sounding, but still impactful jam. I love the the production palette of this more than Magnificent, honestly, and I think that uh, utilizes their sonic components a lot better. The bass sounds fucking killer on here, which gets to shine in some big ways, especially on tracks like I'm Here to Stay and I Need a Theory. I love the bass work on there, while also having a chance to do something a little weird and groovy on In Between Ice Ages, which kind of sees the band tapping into a little bit more of a quirky, strange song presentation by having this very flat delivery by Craig with these ambient guitars and synths to create a, a more bleaker, colder track, which in and of itself acts as sort of the farthest back in the timeline, you know, before man was man, sort of talking about the growth of the world into what it is today, which I think is wedged really well between the kinetic as fuck I'm here to stay, which has this great emotional climax to it, and the soft interlude Nikola Tesla, which sees Matt in the forefront singing about sort of Nikola Tesla's end framed into his legacy. It's, it's an interesting sort of small moment in this that sort of acts as a great center point for a lot of the tangential ideas to sort of begin to coerce together. And I talked a bit about the sort of lyrical planting and payoffs cropping up on the back end of the record, but it helps enhance those catchier moments that are early on as sort of reprises on the record's closing moments, because that first run from course through complaints through Don't Mess This Up act as some of their catchiest biggest songs on the project and have just banger after banger after banger while introducing those new ideas and broader concepts. Hell, the cyclical, almost mantra-style writing of Don't Mess This Up feels like the motivational speech one gives themselves before trying to conquer the world. I love how the choruses of, or at least the lines from I Need a Theory and that crop back up on I Need a Mirror and Sea Monster, which close the record out. And I love how big Sea Monster builds to to act like this show-stopping climax. I really like this record. I liked it a lot when it came out in my uh, top 20 of the year. It was on there. I think that it is a great evolution of their sound and maturation of their sound in ways that are different for them, but I think stick the landing. I feel like if you've enjoyed Janelle especially, you should spin Zestera, because it's a, it's a cool sort of 
peek into where their some of their ideas from there would evolve into later on down the line. Which, speaking of Janelle, I think that it is a really good starting point for a band like this. It shows some of their influence sonically and songwriting-wise while revolving a lot of the themes of the writing around metaphors within a relationship and has some really snarky moments that I think are pretty fucking choice. Comparing one's growth in relationship to Manifest Destiny on the opener sets a really good stage for things that I think gets subverted into some real toxic realms that the album dwells in uh, a lot in some pockets, like on Sexy Terrorist, which sort of creates this sensual juxtaposition of admittedly where a lot of song topics were in the 2000s with the allure of sex and lust early on in a relationship. And almost basking in that toxicity like on tracks like Stick and Carrot with its paranoid edge to its writing or Shallow and Lid Sea and Jackson Pollock is Dead which talk about the impending doom within that relationship and liking it to death or assisted death with each other. The accusatory sass on Good Morning Little Bird with its bright piano melody I think is an interesting avenue for them to explore and similarly to some of the experiments on a record like Everything Everything's Man Alive uh, it feels like an avenue that they do kind of explore but not quite like how they do here and it's an interesting piece in their discography when looking back. While also catching a glimpse into a life that you could have had in the hypnotic and dreamlike I Pinch Myself which acts as an interesting middle point in this record. It's got some catchy moments and it's got a hint at some of the catchiness that they would uh, further explore on records after this but it's a really good foundation for them to spring from in my opinion. I feel like this is a pretty decent place to start if you enjoy again just 2000s indie rock. I would give this a spin. It might scratch that itch in a way that you've been looking for with a band that you've never heard before. It's also got a production style that feels very raw and indie 2000s in the best way possible. I love this record a lot and I think that even though it is at this point in the discography, it is kind of an essential listen, in my opinion. Now, while Buckminster is easily DPC's most cohesively conceptual and arguably their tightest record, given it's just a tight 10-minute rager that has this through line of using philosophies and events laid out by one Buckminster Fuller, an eccentric guy who had uh, some interesting ideas based on what some of the songs about here are about, and linking those to where, especially in the early 2010s, aspects of culture were shifting via the rise of, like, early, early influencers in like the late 2000s, early 2010s. It's an interesting sort of comparison and, and sort of ties into other album style parallels they've drawn on other records after this especially, but is also sonically their biggest sounding record. They definitely took what they were doing on Expert and sort of teasing uh, and nurtured it and fleshed it out into a well-rounded album that I would still argue should have been their springboard into bigger stardom because not only do they make their songwriting even catchier than it was on Cholera and about as catchy as it was on Expert, songwriting wise they really knock it out of the park. I mean I feel like parallels drawn here in the way that they make some of the eccentric ideas of Buckminster Fuller more relatable a la what a band like Coheed and Cambria does throughout their concept albums uh, just comes across brilliantly. You know, while House of 1982 Built Like a Ship is a song written, I think, about Buckminster Fuller's daughter, the way that they talk about being a father and the sort of wants for one's child, uh, again, are made so much more relatable on a surface level in a more unified, broader sense that I think transcends the niche 
market that this album could have been more focalized toward. You know, the idea of Inspectors of Inspectors sort of almost being a parallel more directly to desire to be one's own boss in an insular sense, the, the more self-employment side within the rise of a younger generation. Uh, and how well that links to what was going on in the late 2000s of young entrepreneurship and all the like is bridged fantastically with a catchy-ass chorus on top of it. Same with House of 1982. Both have catchy-ass, rafter-reaching choruses. The sort of bridging of Buckminster Fuller's daily journaling and old journaling as a whole as a parallel to modern vlogging in a sense, I think is kind of reached on... Dimebaxian Chronophile, or at least showcases that even back then people were all about self-documenting in the way that they were at the turn of the decade. And yeah, there's moments that get even more niche with the Buckminster stuff, like he plants houses like trees, which feels more just like a character piece about Buckminster Fuller, or Letter to Michael, which is a track that is written about a moment in Buckminster's life where he wrote in response to a child who wrote him asking about the opinions of doing versus thinking in a weird sort of way. You know, tracks like American Princes and El Cid 3 sort of dive more into the world that Buckminster feels like he's living towards, uh, while also having some commentary about not meddling, but falling middle class. You know, there's another track on here called We're Cheap Already, which sort of also uh, talks about there's a track on here, Weird Cheap Already, which sort of ties in. There's a track on here, Weird Cheap Already, which sort of ties into that too, being inspired by a bar in Chicago. Like, there, there's other things that it's sort of skirting the lines of talking about, but it does, by the by, keep things focalized, and anything else feels more like building to the world we are in versus what maybe Buckminster Fuller was trying to craft. The overall well produced version of the band that exists on here is also tight as fuck. The organ intro on We Live in Circles and Eat on Merry-Go-Round sets a really good stage. The riff work on here is great as a whole. Dimaxian Crotified and He Plants Houses Like Trees are really fun, leaner tracks. The bigger sounds on those catchier tracks I already mentioned do a good job at sticking out uh, amongst the crop of other rock ragers that coat this thing. Even the softer moments, like A Letter to Michael and The Closer Safe as Houses, which sort of brings the album to a really good resolve, uh, do a good job at keeping the the sonic dynamics even more spread out in their own lane. I like this album a lot. I think it's really fucking choice. I think it should have been bigger than it ended up in hindsight. Either way, I think this is absolutely a place that one must get to, if not a place that they start at outright, because even though it is super niche in its writing, it is very, very accessible and real feeling in a sort of relatable sense. But cholera is just a wonderful evolution on Janelle's roots that I think makes it one of the best indie albums of the 2000s. While I think that a lot of the sounds on Buckminster are really nice and clean and catchy, there are moments on here that they don't toy with quite in the same way on some of those records that they dropped after this, at least not until Zestera came around. You know, the bass play on tracks like Let's Do This Here and Skeletons is fantastic. The production style on here, I also kind of like a little bit more than Buckminster. I love the sounds on that record, but I think that this just feels like a more well-rounded indie sounding record that lets their bite in their songwriting and their, their tongue-in-cheek style that was still sort of seen on here expanded on from Janelle uh, just have all the chance to shine. You know, while tracks like Let's Do This Here and Mountains and Ruins and Combustible on Contact look at relationships in a little more of a direct way, especially with Let's Do This Here having this real bite to it that feels like a meltdown argument, and Inertia is a bitch talking a little bit more physically about an altercation uh, in, a, in a very direct way. It does so in a way that I think is well accented and sharp. And on Combustible on Contact, in fact, it creates beauty out of it. I love that fucking song. And even getting sort of indie in a quirky kind of way, like on Skeletons, which has this 
larger than life spacious intro before breaking it down with a bass driven groove about kids on a cute little night together getting weird and a good homo sapien almost talking about the fact that no lifetime is led without a, l a couple bad decisions made along the way especially when getting to the top. Flip the lever takes that glimmer of optimism in a life without bad decisions and tries to get inspirational with it after that by having this slow burn explosion to it that I think is executed very fucking well. I just love this record, man. I think that it's got a lot of the songwriting quirks that I love about this band done a little more diversely. Again, while I like the production on the more catchy stuff, I love the production on this more. And while it's not necessarily the tightest record, I like the avenues it dips into sonically that deviate similarly to where Janelle and Expert had kind of dabbled in. I love this record, and I think that if you don't start with Janelle, I would definitely start with Cholera and work around the discography from there. I just think that, in general, this band should have more fans because I think that they write some really solid jams. And that's my thoughts on Dreadless Pony Club's discography. Do you listen to them? Have you ever listened to them? If you have, sign off in the comments with your favorite album and some of your favorite songs. If you like this video, give it a like. If you want to see more, consider subscribing. I drop two to four vids a week depending on what I've got going on. Thank you again so very much for watching. I have been Viral Rack. You guys have good day in situations, and I'll see you another day. Mm -hmm.